Thank you very much. Good morning to uh, everybody. I'm a big fan of Wired. Congratulations on the 100th uh, edition. And I think I spoke at one of the early conferences, so it's good to be back here. Um, and Greg, I noticed that you wrote in your editorial about the concern that you have around people saying they've had enough of experts uh, and also encouraging uh, entrepreneurs and innovators because there's never been a better time to be an entrepreneur and an innovator. And I want to talk about that, if I may, uh, a little bit. Um, so I'm going to talk about innovation for everyone. I'm going to just focus on, on three big trends that I think are really top of mind for us uh, at Google and hopefully for many of you, and touch on a little bit some of the challenges that those trends bring to us, as you, as you suggested. And I thought, how can I do something in a very wired way? So I thought I'd start by introducing you to Flora. And Flora is a connected cow. And she's in the Netherlands, and she's wearing that connected device uh, uh, from Connectera. And what that allows uh, her farmers to do is monitor her behaviors, when she's ruminating, how she's moving, can tell whether she's limping. And that is collected and using machine learning, powered by TensorFlow, which is our open source machine learning toolkit, uh, they're able to improve the health of the cow and improve the yields from the cow. So hopefully, the connected cow is a happy cow. And the reason I tell that story is it brings together three things that I think are the important trends. Connection, uh, new ways of computing and the power that comes with that to build better tools for everyone, and then capability, how we learn in new and different ways. And those are the trends that I want to talk about. So it's a little bit cold, and I need to ask you for some energy, if I may, just to illustrate those three trends. Are you up for that? Yeah, yeah, good, OK, thank you very much. <laughs> just want to raise, do, do my best uh, to raise the energy uh, and heat in the room. Um, firstly, a question to all of you. Right now, who has a connected device on them? Raise your hand and say yes. 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 OK, who has two connected devices on them right now? Yes, yes. yes. Three connected devices. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Four connected devices. Anybody? This is wired. Come on, people. Gentlemen at the back. So there we go. So William Gibson said the future is already here. It's just unevenly distributed. And the first thing that really um, should color all of our thinking in the digital world is that today being connected is a minority sport still. 3.4, 3.5 billion people connected, the majority on the planet still not connected, and that changes over the next three, four, five years. So you get to 5 billion connected people in 2020, the majority connected, and soon everyone connected. Perhaps 5 billion devices, 20, 5 billion people connected, perhaps 25 billion devices connected. Not sure how many cows. I uh, need to look that up. Should have done that earlier. But um, my point being that that transforms lives, access to all the world's information in your pocket, access to all the people are, that are online, and access to ever smarter tools. And of course, that creates huge opportunity for innovators and entrepreneurs who can connect instantly and costlessly with 5 billion or more people. So that's the first kind of big trend uh, that I'm going to talk about uh, in more detail. Second trend. Uh, Machine learning, artificial intelligence. How many people have used machine learning or artificial intelligence today? Anybody? Yeah. About 20%, 30% of people are saying yes. An informed audience. If you've used Search or Google Maps or YouTube or Gmail, you've used machine learning. Uh, because these tools are helping us to understand language and images and videos uh, right now, helping us to filter spam. and uh, I think it's a very exciting time. If you look at something like Google Translate, uh, Google Translate's been around for a while. It started out, it was a little bit clunky, uh, and it's improved and improved and improved. Actually, one of the things that the EU has done for technology is in the early days of translation, we were able to translate, uh, we were able to ingest all of the brilliant translation that's done between 27 member state languages uh, and use that to start to understand uh, nuanced language and translation in nuanced language. But what uh, we've been able to do uh, more recently is, using machine learning, build neural machine translation. Uh, and it gets better and better and better. We did English Chinese first. Within six weeks, we've done a whole bunch of new languages. And now it's powering significantly improved translation across over 103 different language pairs. And this is making significant advances. When you spoke to Google uh, two or three years ago, we would get what you said slightly wrong 25% of the time. Now it's under 6% of the time. And so these models are really allowing us to build better tools for everyone. Why is that important? Well, 
If you take speaking into a phone, if you can't read uh, or if you just uh, don't have the time to be able to speak to a device, that's quite helpful. Uh, and now we can identify with fewer data points more accurately what you're saying. And that allows less data cost and allows a cheaper device uh, to do the same things as a high-end device. And of course, that benefits the next 5 billion people who are coming uh, online. And third question for all of you, has anybody ever learned how to do something by watching a YouTube video? Anybody? Uh, would anybody like to share with me what they've learned? Yep. Go on. Are you embarrassed? Would you like to say yes? Go on. I, I learned to play better tennis. Better tennis. Very good. Anybody else learn something, something else? Yes. To tie a tie. To tie a tie. That's probably one of the things I hear most commonly. What else? To fix a boiler. Learning something you need in the moment you need it. That's often the case. Washing machines I've fixed before. Yes, Greg. Uh, better front crawl stroke. Front crawl stroke. I knew you were an athlete, sir. <laughs> yeah. Uh, new coding language. New coding language. Absolutely. Languages are popular, both technology and other languages. Anything else that you'd like to share? Anybody learn how to cook? Gentleman at the back with multiple devices. What have you learned? I'm interested. Uh, I didn't learn to cook, but I learned how to do multi-camera I thought it'd be something technical. Multi-camera editing in something, something, something. Um, <laughs> But this is the third trend. So if we talk about connection and we talk about the capability of computing taking off, the third trend I think is really interesting, which is learning uh, from people like us in the moments we need it. If you think about who you learn from there, it's almost always somebody like you. Somebody who, why would you make a you know, video about how to fix a boiler? Well, because actually you're really proud that you fixed a boiler and you think it might be useful to other people. So new ways of learning and also new ways of innovation because uh, Matt Ridley, one of my favorite authors on this, uh, talks about the fact that innovation is just ideas having sex. And it's f if five billion people are connected and can share their ideas, then you can, f you, you can uh, inspire people to learn new skills and you can inspire people to be creative in new ways. So I think those are three big trends that color a lot of what we're thinking about today. Uh, but they also bring challenges, and I want to make sure that I talk about those challenges too. So the first trend, you know, if we're all able to access all the world's information and we've all got connected devices uh, that can uh, take photographs and take video and that we can publish on, then everyone's a publisher. Everyone's a publisher. And, you know, one of the key issues that we've seen uh, grappled with in the media is fake news and truth. So in a world where everyone's a publisher, how do you ensure the content that you're consuming is actually true? Uh, and I think there's a couple of things which we really think hard about at Google uh, how do we make sure that quality, authentic content thrives and can be found? And what do you do about the bad actors, the people who are um, doing fake news or have illegal and harmful content? And that's a real challenge. So some of the stuff we've done, Google News has been around for 16 years now, 80,000 accredited news sources. We know you are who you say you are. And when we look for news stories, when you come to Google, you're typically asking us a question. Uh, and if it's about news, we can go to those news sources. And in fact, we send something like 10 billion clicks a month through to publishers uh, because people are searching for news and news stories. Uh, one of the challenges in fake news is misrepresentation. So the Macedonian village that threw up 100 websites about US politics, that's clearly people misrepresenting who they are. That's the most obvious uh, type of fake news. Um, we are uh, fact-checking. Uh, independent bodies are fact-checking news stories to try to give users more confidence that they've got something that's accurate as well. But of course, even within news, there's a diversity of opinion, uh, and you may, not dis you may not agree with the uh, agenda of any one publication, and we want to make sure that people have got access to that diversity of opinion too. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, we come across uh, the bad actors. Uh, and we try to make sure that we go after money so that people don't have a financial incentive uh, online. So we took 1.7 billion bad ads out of our system. We uh, removed 300, videos, 300 million videos on YouTube from monetization, trying to make sure that we maintain high standards about who can make money and where the financial incentives come from. You may be familiar with our AdSense program. It paid out, I think, 11 billion to uh, people uh, who are monetizing their websites. Only 12% of people who apply for AdSense actually get into the program, and we removed over 100,000 uh, publishers from AdSense violating policy. So we're constantly trying to make sure the financial incentives aren't there as well. And then uh, you've seen in the news this, this year in particular concerns about extremist content online. And that's one of the hardest things to identify. So people will say, you know, you're quite good at making sure I can't see pornography where I shouldn't see it, but why can't you do the same with terrorist and extremist violent content? 
And I think the challenge there is, you know, it's probably relatively easy for us to agree between us what is and is not pornography. It's actually quite a lot harder to agree in a consistent way what is and isn't uh, terrorist and extremist content. And we need help from governments and others uh, in order to uh, agree that definition. But then secondly, once you've agreed it, identifying using technology, you know, what is usually a man speaking to a camera about politics and which of those uh, videos does and doesn't violate that line, that's also challenging to do. So we've been working hard in, with an increasing number of expert authorities and NGOs to help us to identify those things with machine learning and technology and a lot more humans to try to understand and define what that looks like. And we're making some good progress there. Um, something in excess of 80 percent now of uh, videos that we remove for being terrorist, violent or extremist content are removed before they see any human flagger. So we're starting to make real progress there, but it's not easy uh, to do. So those are the, some of the challenges in a world where we've all got access to this fantastic information resource and everyone can be a publisher. There are challenges in making sure that quality content can thrive and that bad actors and bad content is removed. Uh, the next trend uh, I talked about was the rise of machine learning and smarter tools for everyone. I think it's a huge, huge, huge opportunity, but it's also easy to find the headlines that say, well, this is going to be massive job destruction and uh, unemployment. Robots and automation and machine learning are just going to render pretty much everything that we do inoperable. And of course, historically, when you go back and look at that, it's true that you know, at the beginning of the century, 80% of the American population was in agriculture, and at the end of the century, 8% was. But fortunately, all of those people have found other things that to do that are productive. So how will this pan out here? And I think you heard those who were here yesterday from my colleague uh, Mustafa from DeepMind about some of the ways that they're thinking about this. I think the evidence seems to be that uh, smarter tools help people to spend more time doing stuff that only people can do, whether it's the work they're doing with the ophthalmologists using machine learning that can see millions of scans of retinas uh, many, many more times than an individual expert can see and use those scans to identify the, the signals from uh, macular degeneration earlier, which allows the clinicians to treat more people with better count outcomes sooner. And I think that kind of trend is what I'm expecting us to see more and more of. And we're working hard to try to make sure that what goes on in machine learning and artificial intelligence uh, is thoughtfully done. Uh, the People and AI Research Unit is something which we established to try to really look at the human AI interface issues and think how can you deal with this stuff responsibly and there needs to be um, you know, public debate and discussion about how this works. But as you'd expect, I'm optimistic about uh, this technology bringing better tools for everyone. An example of that, uh, this is Orknet, which is a Japanese uh, site that uh, does lots of things including car auctions. It would take 20 minutes to upload perhaps 20 different photographs of a car in order to identify it. Using TensorFlow, they've been able to develop technology that can real-time identify an image of a car, which saves a whole bunch of time and a whole bunch of cost, which means the humans involved can get on with what they're doing, whether it's somebody who wants to sell their car through an auction or somebody who's working at the company. So simple ways of seeing humans becoming more productive, just like we're all more productive because of electricity. Um, and so it's how we harness these tools that are important. So, you know, in this world where these three big trends that I've mentioned are powerful and positive, but we're also in a world where um, uh, people are not necessarily equipped with the skills that they need uh, to confront this new world. So the EU itself did some research and said that um, something in excess of half of the population need digital skills that they don't currently have, that potentially nearly a million jobs would go unfilled because of a lack of digital skills for business. And that's one of the things that when I took this role three years ago, uh, I talked to colleagues about and we said this, isn't so, this is surely something we can do something about. So we've made basic digital skills training available with partners uh, across the whole of Europe. And we thought we might be able to train a million Europeans in two years. In three years, we've trained five million Europeans and a million in Africa in basic digital skills. How to understand websites, do online marketing, analytics, and so on. The kinds of skills that can help you make your business more successful. So we were blown away by the demand uh, for those skills. Interestingly, 47% uh, of the people who've gone on our training where we've collected the data have been women. Uh, it shows that there's real demand there. In some other countries where we've collected the data and the programs haven't been targeted at youth, we found the average age has been in the mid-40s. So this is really skills for everyone, and it shows you the latent demand that's there and the latent curiosity for people uh, to learn and develop and apply those skills. So big positive trends, each of which brings some challenges and some questions, uh, but consumers 
This is the Edelman Trust Barometer. Consumers are concerned about the future. Uh, they fear what's coming, and they fear the pace of change. They fear immigration. And you saw at the beginning of this year the, uh, the report here, which is across 33 different countries and uh, tens of thousands of consumers, saying that there was a, an implosion of trust. And uh, one of the challenges that we all face is that that causes uh, people to be really concerned, and the trust in governments and media in particular has fallen significantly. Um, but when you step back and you look at the big picture, there's never been a better time to be alive. Uh, poverty, infant mortality, mortality, illiteracy are falling faster than at any time in history. The gap between the rich and poor on a global level is uh, falling faster than ever time, any time in history as well. And if we can harness these big trends and empower people in the ways that I've outlined, then we can really build a, a significantly better future together. So um, I think there's never been a better time to be an innovator or an entrepreneur. It's huge opportunity to harness these trends and these technologies for good. And it's really for people like you uh, who are curious and thoughtful about this uh, to take advantage of those opportunities. Thank you very much.